Buenas tardes. Today we will be talking about revolutions, technological revolutions, revolutions that have led to a change, a cultural, societal uh, change, and also technological. I will be in particular talking about games as AI revolutions. And I will be, today with you, I will be exploring the wonderful relationship between artificial intelligence and games. As we will see later on, games have led to the revolution of AI, but also to the revolution of our culture, our society, and our future at large. People often ask me, where is Malta? So I have this wonderful map here. Malta is down there, right? It's a tiny island, it's a wonderful island, pictures. I, research, I, I direct an institute of digital games there where we do research with game design and artificial intelligence in games. I write books about the topic and I also own a company that is called Model AI that uses AI to automatically test games. Um, I come from a nearby place which is called Greece, over there. It's, a, it's an island called Crete where I visit and I teach once in a while. So, I have a question for you, just to make my point quite um, a strong one. How many of you in this audience play games? Right. So, you already see what sort of quiet revolution we are talking about here. Games are everywhere in our lives. They shape the way we think, they shape the way we feel, they shape, they, they shape the way we communicate, socialize, and so many other things. We actually learn through games, we become better people, right? So, I will just leave games outside from the picture for the moment, and then I will move on to the other revolution that we currently experience, and that is artificial intelligence. And let me define it, let me use, let me use one of my favorite definitions of it, so that I make my point about the current wonderful relationship between the two. AI is making computers able to do things which currently only humans can do. Now, when it comes to games, the question that arises is, what do humans do in games? Now, the first thing that comes to mind, obviously, to most of you, I would, I would guess, is obviously, humans play. Thank you. <laughs> Great, so this is actually very true. And as humans, we play a lot of games, and you would expect that AI should be able to play games as well, right? So it's making, making things that we do, imitating things that we do. As a matter of fact, AI has been playing games since, since its very birth, 70 years ago. And this slide here demonstrates that history. All the way back from the 50s, from Alan Turing, uh, the father of computer science and artificial intelligence, where he used, he actually designed algorithms on chessboards back in the day, all the way to DeepMind's, um, sorry, Deep Blue, uh, IBM's um, uh, machine that won Kasparov back in the 90s in chess, all the way to today's DeepMind's impressive uh, results with AlphaStar in arguably the most complex game that we humans play nowadays, which is called StarCraft, right? So if you visit a Wikipedia article of artificial intelligence, you will soon realize that all key milestones that AI has achieved, they have been achieved through games. But one might wonder, so we have, received, we have, we have obtained really astonishing results with artificial intelligence, beating the best humans in the world in what they do, play games. But one wonders, is this, have we really achieved super intelligence or general intelligence? Well, as a matter of fact, we have achieved something, but that something is like systems that they play, that they do something very well on a very particular, very specific game. And I wouldn't argue, it's gonna be hard to argue that we do something more than that. And actually games offer so much more to artificial intelligence than playing. So going back to my original questions, what do humans actually do in games? They actually do far more creative things with games. We actually design games. And you might sort of already think, how about an AI that is a computational designer? How about an AI that actually designs wonderful games for us? Well, just try to think about it. Um, think about games. Since all of you play games, you might have noticed that games is the area where architecture meets art 
and creativity, where problem solving meets engineering, where uh, you know, interactivity and design meet. This is, the, this is a very unique domain. No other domain actually has all these things together in a, in a single package. And games are full of content of various types. I mean, you have wonderful visuals all the way to music, to text and narrative, to level architecture and game rules. And all these various and different forms of content, you put them together and you offer an experience to humans. Now, that is pretty unique. And it's very challenging to ask AI to actually create something like that for us. Um, and it is very, very challenging indeed. Yeah? But we have been making some really great progress over the last few years towards this direction. So I'll just show you some examples I'm really proud of. Looking at um, human history of creativity on how humans create masterpieces of art, one thing is pretty obvious, that we humans actually create in an iterative fashion, and most often we do that in a collaborative fashion. What you see here is a wonderful masterpiece from Persepolis in Iran, in Persia, and you see the three different phases of a masterpiece creation. Each one of the phases is taken care of by a different artist specialized artists. So on the left, you see the first sketch of the statue, then you see some details put on the statue, and then the third artist is actually finalizing the, art, the, the statue. There's a fourth artist that is specialized on the face, um, and all these guys actually work together to, to create this. What, what this thing is called is iterative refinement when, when it comes to creativity. So we were inspired by this process, and we created tools that designers can use while they design games. So what you see here is an initial sketch of a level that a designer has in mind, and then it consults AI in a collaborative fashion. And then the AI is sort of proposing things, levels for the designer to consider. The designer adjusts the level or the map. There are things that he or she likes, things that he or she doesn't like. And now it talks back to the machine again, asking for new suggestions in a higher resolution. And this sort of creative dialogue goes back and forth for a, for a number of times, and then the designer is ultimately happy. So this is, this is the type of AI human co-creation I'm talking about. But we can do far more than that. We can actually have AI that designs complete games for us. This game is called Yavalath, and Yavalath was designed by a system called Ludi, which was in turn designed by a human called Cameron Brown. All right? Yavalath is a is a game of it's a hexagonal game of size five, and it features two very simple rules. If you have three tokens in a row, you lose. If you have four tokens in a row, you win. It's a wonderful game, and as a matter of fact, it has participated in several um, game design competitions, and it won. It won against many games that humans, we humans, designed. Now you might wonder, and some of you might already wonder, like, surely is this real, real creativity? Is this considered actual creativity? So my response to you is, how many of us in this room can actually design such a game? Right? Or let me put it more strongly. Just compare Yavalas to this form of creativity. Right? Um, this is a gate in the middle of nowhere. It's creative, right? Um, how about this? This is a sign that penetrates a, a tent. This is creative design. Right? Who, who designed this? Was it machines? Was it humans? Um, these examples actually bring us to the fine line between, between unconventional thinking, creativity, and let me, let me call it stupidity as well. And actually uh, brings us to reveal the level of difficulty AI faces when it has to imitate stupidity, irrational thinking, and generally anything that is unconventional. Artificial stupidity is far harder to achieve than artificial intelligence. Let me go back to my original question. What do we do in games? In games, we experience, we feel. How about AI that actually does the same? Well, there are some really cool examples I'm really proud of here. One of them is our collaboration with Ubisoft, where we collected data from players playing um, uh, popular games from Ubisoft on one end, and on the other end, we have been asking them about you know, their motivation values while they're playing games. Then we utilized machine learning to learn the map in between the two. And the results are quite astonishing, because just by looking at the way you play, 
nowadays, particular games of Ubisoft nowadays, we're able to tell uh, which um, the levels of uh, competence, autonomy, relatedness, and presence that you experience while playing those games with near certainty, up to 95% accuracy. This is really impressive. Just by looking at how you play, you can sort of infer motivation of players. But we were not happy enough, so we wanted to take it to the next level. And we just wanted to ask the question, what if we just look at the pixels of a screen of a player playing a game and then trying to infer the level of tension of that particular player? Um, no strings attached here, no facial expression recognition, no physiological data, nothing, just the pixels of your screen. By applying a sophisticated computer vision system, we were able to predict the tension level of players with up to 90% accuracy, which is pretty impressive. So what you see here on the right is what AI is looking at, a visualization of what AI is looking at while you're playing your game so that it predicts the tension of your game. And as you might see, it actually looks at how you play, but it also looks at particular user interface elements, such as the score, the timer, and the health bar. Now, let me, in my last part of my presentation, let me get a bit more serious. Um, I would argue that all games are serious because, well, well, the good games at least, they teach us something. They make us better, as I already said. But there are part particular games that they are designed for good. AI and games for good, for health, for education, as illustrated by a number of projects that I will be talking about. First example is this award-winning game that we designed that teaches children to deal with conflicts. So the setup is in a multiplayer city in a mid medieval village, as you see now. And the game puts children into conflict quests so that they learn how to resolve them. So the, the AI adapts to the level of current conflict that exists in the, in, the, in the game, and it generates quests so that the conflict level remains within appropriate bounds. And in that way, we have been seeing impressive results across several different countries in Europe uh, using that game, in how children actually resolve conflicts in, uh, in an efficient way. You can, use, you can go one step further and use AI to profile students and their dyslexia type and propose particular playful activities for them to experience, such as, for instance, you know, pick the right word for a song or cut a particular word in syllabus. Right? And the results, again, from various studies across several European schools have been quite impressive because such game activities do motivate children to play more, engage more in the classroom, and accelerate learning of dyslexia, actually. You can take it one step further and use AI to profile the scientific skills of students and offer personalized content in virtual labs such as chemistry or uh, wind energy. And you can move away from education and focus on health, on mental health, and use games and artificial intelligence to treat um, disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a game we designed that is called Startle Mart. And it's a game that realizes virtual exposure therapy. So it puts war veterans that have been experienced, uh, that they suffer from PTSD, uh, into a virtual scenario. And it sort of puts them into really difficult, stressful moments that we use in order to uh, treat them through virtual, uh, through virtual exposure therapy. So the game is designed in a supermarket setting as as you will see here, as surprising enough, if you suffer from PTSD, you're really stressed when you enter a supermarket, right? Because there are sort of very weird moments for you. You meet people, people are looking at you, people talk to you, you have to stand in a queue, and all this is very stressful for people in, uh, suffering from PTSD. So on top of that level of stress, we utilized, we introduced some sort of war flashback moments. So while you explore the supermarket and you have to pick stuff, you experience this, like a flashback moment back to war. And all these are selected by artificial intelligence, right? So they're picked so that your stress is maximized and exposure therapy is maximized. And here's another flashback moment. How do we detect stress? We use physiological sensors and we profile the stress level of, of our uh, war veterans. Now, <clears throat> by now, I hope I have convinced you that games are the final frontier for artificial intelligence, as they offer unique arenas 
where we can test algorithms and we can advance them. We have been doing that for the last 70 years, right? So why not keep doing it? And most importantly, I think, AI is also the final frontier for games, their design and their development, as AI can design entirely new games we haven't seen before, entirely new experiences for us to experience, but also entirely new, different and complex problems for AI to solve and advance further. If you're interested more in the relationship between AI and games, you're welcome to join us in the next summer school that we're organizing in Copenhagen next June. Thank you so much for your attention. Has been a pleasure.